Hello. In our previous church, when we met to discuss the Bible with our teens group, we used a strategy which helped us called um, shockers and blockers. We would read a passage from the Bible and talk about the parts of it that really surprised us, so the shockers, and then which parts we found hard to understand or we had questions about, so the blockers. And this was quite a good way to approach the Bible, especially those bits that we're more familiar with. If we've read something a few times before, sometimes we forget just how shocking it is. Now, I know that we're looking at carols in these thoughts for the day, not Bible passages, but I think shockers and blockers would be a good way for us to approach today's carol, which is Once in Royal Devi City, because there's a danger that we're so familiar with it that it doesn't have the impact on us that it might. And we'll look at the Bible too, because we want to check that what's in the carol matches what's in the Bible. A bit of background first. This carol was written around 1848 by someone called Cecil Francis Alexander. And I've got a picture of him here so you can see what he looked like. Oh, OK. Turns out that Cecil was a woman. Well, there's our first shocker before we even started. Let's clear up a potential blocker in this first verse, shall we? Why is it described as Royal David City? Is it like Royal Leamington Spa or Royal Tunbridge Wells? Not really, it's referring to Bethlehem, which was the birthplace of Israel's greatest king, King David. And this is the setting for the carol. And the shocking thing here is that hidden away in this historic royal city, you have a lowly, in other words, a humble birth of a baby. But the baby is none other than Jesus Christ. Christ means anointed king. So it's understandable that a king would be born in a royal city, but why in a cattle shed? Verse two is even more shocking. It says that he, the Christ, the king, who was Lord of all, God and Lord of all, came down to earth from heaven. So whereas every other human being's life begins in their mother's womb, this baby, this Jesus, already existed before his own birth. This is mind-blowing stuff. He left the grandeur of heaven to come and live amongst the poor and mean and lowly. By the way, the word mean here doesn't mean unkind. It means poor or shabby. This is what Paul will go on to write about later on in the Bible when he says that Jesus didn't consider his status in heaven something he needed to cling to. But instead, he made himself nothing, becoming human. So plenty of shockers so far. Let's move on to the next two verses. How does Cecil describe this Lord of all, this Christ child? She uses words that are actually quite uncomfortable to read, describing him as little, weak and helpless. We're used to thinking of Jesus in terms of his power and his authority. But here she reminds us of the vulnerability of Jesus as a newborn baby. And she goes on to paint a picture of Jesus as a toddler and a young child. Now, the Bible is frustratingly quiet on the subject of Jesus' early years. We have one verse in Luke's Gospel, which simply tells us, And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. That's it. The whole childhood. There's also an account of an incident when he was 12. But these two verses in the carol seem to be talking about his very early years. Tears and smiles are mentioned, the normal things of childhood. Can you imagine Jesus chuckling at a game of peekaboo with his mum or his dad? Or crying when he fell over and grazed his knees and needed a cuddle to console him? And then we have these words that are such an encouragement to us. Because Jesus experienced the same sorts of things as we do, the everyday mess of life. Jesus understands when we feel sadness or gladness because he's been there. He knows what it's like. He's described as our childhood's pattern in this carol. He's the perfect child for our children to imitate. And then we have these lines that so often prompt a knowing wink or maybe a hard glare among the family line at the carol service. Through gritted teeth we glare at our children and sing, Christian children all should be mild, obedient, good as he. Basically, kids, why can't you behave yourself like Jesus did? Why do you have to be so badly behaved, especially in church? Wait till I get you home. And suddenly the cowl moves to the future. 
in the last two verses, how our eyes at last shall see him when we get to heaven. Or should I say, if we get to heaven. Because verse 3 and 4 have left me feeling a bit uneasy. I know that Christian children should be mild, obedient, good as he, but they're not, are they? And neither are adults, more to the point, neither am I. I could sing this carol and come away with the idea that if I'm going to stand any chance of my eyes seeing Jesus in heaven, I really need to get my act together and start living better in the here and now. Well, I don't know if that's the idea that Cecil wants us to take away with us, but it's a wrong idea. The Bible makes it very clear that trying to live a good life and a perfect life like Jesus did is impossible. He is the only one in the history of humankind to have done it. And I'm not suddenly going to come along and become the number two person to do it. No, the way to heaven is not found by desperately trying to keep the rules as best we can and then hope that it's good enough. What this carol lacks is any sense of what Jesus went on to do as an adult. We skip from his childhood to him back in heaven again and we miss the crucial part about what he did for us in his death and his resurrection. And we need those pieces if we're going to understand the full story. Basically, we can't really understand Christmas without understanding Easter. So I'd like to suggest, if I may, another verse to go in between verses four and five to help us to see what Jesus did as an adult, what he achieved for us. But we cannot meet his standards. Selfish hearts lead us astray. Jesus knew his father's mission he would die to make a way. Justice, wrath and love displayed, all our sins on Jesus laid. Well, it's a work in progress, but you get the idea. Since our sins have been laid on Jesus when he died on the cross, we can be forgiven by God and we can know the certainty that our place in heaven is guaranteed, that one day we will see him there. If we believe that this little baby, this little weak and helpless baby, who grew up to teach and heal and die on the cross, if we believe that he is the Son of God, the Christ, and if we accept that he paid the price for our sins, then we can receive the best Christmas gift ever, a new relationship with our Creator. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus into the world as a vulnerable, weak and helpless little baby. Thank you, Lord, for what he experienced in his childhood. And as an adult, he, knows, he knew the sadnesses and the gladness of life as well. And he can identify with everything that we go through because we experience good times and the bad times. We thank you for what Jesus went on to do as an adult, the teaching, the healing, the miracles, the way that he showed us what you are like, Father God. And we thank you that he went to die on a cross to take the punishment for all the wrong things that we've done. Help us, Lord, to understand that the message of Christmas and the message of Easter are linked. To see that connection, Lord, help us to respond to your great gift to us. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen and happy Christmas.